recording. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Review session number two. Hopefully, this provides a lovely gift wrap on the tail end of our course. Talk about everything we've talked about in the last six months in under an hour. So really put all of this material in a blender and condense it in the most palatable way possible. That is what I am here for today. A lot of questions came in about how data visualization applies to the full stack. You'll hear all these expensive LinkedIn words thrown around, you know, full stack developer with big data and, you know, AI machine learning visualization. We can throw all these expensive words around, but a lot of the questions came in regarding how do I actually deploy a visualization in a fashion where other people can use it, can see it, can interact with it? What is the entire pipeline of making my stuff internet available look like in order that I don't have to sit next to a person with my laptop, I can actually just send a link out. Um, what does interactivity look like in visualization? We talk about the visual theory. We talk about humans liking shapes that they can compare in horizontal and vertical lines, but what is actually interacting with those horizontal and vertical lines and shapes in a browser look like? And the, uh, the tools to do so, and hopefully we can use that as an opportunity to definitely talk about JavaScript. We flew through that. It is increasingly the most prevalent language in our world. Everything from the front end to, you know, Node JavaScript doing everything that, you know, the Pythons and the, the backend languages of the world can do. Um, we can pepper in a little bit of visual theory, you know, oh, yes, and, um, and um, I put together a little web app that I will send the, the GitHub repo out at the, uh, the tail end of class. We'll go through my thinking of kind of the problem that I wanted to address, how I began thinking about the problems to visualize what my code looks like to generate that. And then uh, tail end, how I put it online. Hopefully my parting gift to everybody here will be a set of instructions on how to deploy your own web app using some of the cool tools we've talked about so far, GitHub pages. And most importantly, how do I recycle other people's work? Because we are not reinventing the wheel. We are standing on the shoulders of giants and reusing other people's work is arguably one of the most important skills in the data handling math coding world. Don't reinvent the wheel, you know, don't fix what's not broken. If you have uh, a, a seemingly common task like deploying a web app, you're probably not the first person to do it. And there's probably a lovely tutorial and probably even a command line tool to do it for you at this point. So, awesome. thank you guys so much. The area in which there is the most gap in visualizing, in my opinion, from what I've seen on a reporting standpoint is text data. You've heard natural language processing be thrown around. We've talked about a little bit of how do we handle words in a computational algorithmic way? How do we make words into numbers? How do we do things like sentiment analysis? What is a happy sentence? What is a sad sentence? And that tells an okay story that works pretty well for chat bots. It works for a customer service. You know, I want to make a reservation type machine. But our first review session focused on music, on poetry, on spoken word. And something that is very understated is tempo and word variation. And that's not covered 
at all in any of the current tools. And I found myself, especially preparing for this class, not wanting to repeat myself, you know, word minimums on writing papers growing up. I don't know if that left you all with as much PTSD as it left me. It's like I said everything I have to say in the first page. My teacher said I have to write three pages. So let me just restate the first page <laughs> with the same words in different, uh, in different combinations. So I found myself just repeating what I was saying a lot, especially with uh, time quotas for this course. It was a, uh, it was a, a great meditation on presenting you guys new and valuable information and controlling the tempo of a delivery. So what I wanted to visualize in two dimensions with this project was spoken word, speeches and written um, emails, term papers, things like research papers. I wanted to get a visual of what is going on in a paper that I think is fantastic, but I obviously think I'm the best writer that I know, just like everybody does at the time that they write something. I want a higher level visual for me to give a representation of parts of a constructed word that I might be missing and go through history and evaluate what the, the real greats in history have been talking about. So I said, start with data. The data that I wanted to um, at least get an idea, I picked one of the best public speakers of all time. We're talking about the I Have a Dream speech today. Thank Kaggle or um, found this somewhere. It's lovely that it's out there. And a little overview on the folder structure that I'm working with. I had enough requests for how do I deploy full stack applications? What does modern JavaScript look like? And although this is not something we taught in the course, I am going with a JavaScript framework and this is a React project. So this folder structure is actually created when I kick off a React project. And I left it basically as it was given because it gives a nice, uh, I added this static folder just for um, this background that you'll see and my sample data, but otherwise basically just gives you an app, which is everywhere that you're gonna do your stuff. We're gonna talk about some D3 today because that's definitely the hardest topic that we've talked about. Uh, especially in JavaScript. And as we've seen, modern JavaScript basically looks like one component that I define being rendered into the main index.html. And they have this public folder, which as we've seen in a couple of our visuals before is as flexible as you need it to be. You define some elements to be populated and then I say, hey, here's my, here's my visualization element and I'm gonna populate that. And as far as interactivity, I want some things that I can uh, use to control that as well. So what do I wanna know when I am thinking about, um, when I'm thinking about spoken word, delivering a message with, um, with a time series of words. Remember we talk about time series as it relates to a lot of classical situations, stock uh, price over time. Anything where your X axis is time, is time series data. That can also be applied to something like a, a spoken or a written message in that I have my first word and my words are perceived chronologically. So we're talking about text as a time series for this visualization. I went with D3 because there wasn't any libraries that offhand give me the functionality that I wanted, the plot leads and the, um, the chart JS libraries of the world are fantastic. They do things really quickly. Um, if you want highly customizable 
very specific visualization, you're still going to want to go with D3. It's not um, an easy library to go with. There's a lot of words to make things happen, but if you're intentional about what you want to be pro produced, you will get exactly the visual you want and not need to go with any of the defaults, you know, with the the chart JS and the, the plot leads of the world, you kind of sell your soul and the, the tableaus, especially you, uh, you kind of sign that deal with the devil where you get a lot of nice functionality right away, but you give up custom ability. And if I want to hover, or I want to click on something, I might not have that available anymore. So basically for you front end wannabes, React is a lovely library. It gives you the idea of a component. A component has a state. And then when the state changes, it reruns this render method. And that render method, after all this cool D3 that we're gonna do, is just gonna spit out an HTML element. So it is the idea of a dynamically constructed HTML element that runs top down from a state change. So it's everything that we would want to do in HTML and JavaScript, but would be a headache to do writing from scratch with setting up those event listeners and uh, all that nonsense. It makes the um, event binding, you know, if I want to click a button, I want to handle it over here, it makes that more intuitive where I don't have to, um, I don't have to reinvent the wheel for where data lives and it's just a really lovely constructed library. I don't mean this to teach React by any means. This is still JavaScript. The, this is a JS file. It's kind of JSX, but um, in the end of the day, it's still, I can just write JavaScript functions the same as we have been the entire time. And the majority of my code is JavaScript. There's a hundred ways to do every single thing in JavaScript. And we are going to talk about the way in which I implemented the thing I wanted to do. We'll talk top to bottom and then we'll look at what this actually produces. And tail end of the day, I hope to be able to show kind of the tutorial that I followed because like any good project, you just find ones that are kind of close to it and then adapt. And that's exactly what I did. I found a Medium article and just ran with that. Highly uh, hope, to, uh, hope to encourage that also. So. I have some data set. We'll talk about how I made this interactive eventually. I'm using VS Code. It gives me nice previews like this. I think that's, uh, that's lovely. And as we've saw with D3 before, I want to I wanna preset my margins of what exactly my uh, visual is, uh, is going to render into on the page specifically what the dimensions are. And then we talked about text cleaning. If I have a data set that looks like this, we remember the idea of entropy. How many ways can an input be configured? We see things like capital letters. We see things like forward slash new lines. We see things like um, periods. Those are important for how we read it, especially proper English. But as far as the meaning of the word and the tempo it's delivered, a lowercase and an uppercase letter are delivered at the same tempo and they contribute the same amount of variability. So I really wanted to compare how the great speakers of the world constructed their tempo and their variance of word usage over the time of the entire message's delivery. And in doing that, I still want to make the input as low dimension as possible. I want to boil out as much of that entropy as possible up front. That's the purpose of data cleaning is to normalize things. And in doing that, here is just some regular expression I wrote, uh, I found online and copy and paste. And this just rips out everything that is not um, alphanumeric. So it takes, it takes my text in, it casts it to a lowercase. So immediately 
every uppercase becomes a lowercase. And then I replace all of these characters that I don't want, which is basically everything that is not alphanumeric, uh, just with an empty string, which essentially trims it out. So this is me just defining a JavaScript function. We've seen this, I uh, hopefully uh, 100, 101 times in this course at this point. React is just JavaScript. It's just a JavaScript library. So I can write JavaScript interchangeably with the library and they work together flawlessly. I have this class, it gets into object-oriented programming, which is a React component, which just gives us the idea of a state and then a set state method. And whenever a state changes in a component, it re-renders the component. That's all that React gives you. It's nice in doing that. But again, it's just a JavaScript library. We are just talking JavaScript. The bread and butter of what we are doing is all in this render library. I'm not claiming this to be um, best practice, in that we can definitely use all of one tool and or all of another. I am only aiming to show the flexibility in working with a library that we've talked about and like D3 and how D3 can interact and work side by side with a library like React in order to create a full deployable uh, web application and do all of the cool JavaScript stuff that we have done up until this point with the, the state management that React gives you. Super cool. So what I wanted to do and the majority of the shortcomings of spoken word and written text documents in my past has been the word variety. I find myself just repeating what was already said toward the end. So I wanna make sure that I have unique words coming throughout. There's a fair spread of, of words throughout the time series of the delivery. Uh, and also the tempo, which we can see with punctuation. Every time, um, for, for me, when I'm writing, I have a ton of run on sentences, I'll have, all of my periods grouped up and then a huge space where there's no punctuation at all. So I wanted some reporting on this. I am not smart or literary enough to go back and read my own work all that often. I just want a picture. I just want to see this without having to read. That's all we're doing with visualization is getting a picture of a piece of data without needing to go data point by data point and evaluate. We, we know that we can read the document from top to bottom. We know that we can listen to the speech. I want higher level meta reporting on that data. And I saw that tempo is represented by punctuation. So I want to gauge my, um, I want to gauge my punctuation usage and I want to gauge the spread of unique words and make sure that um, make sure that I don't have too many run on sentences. I don't have any um, weird combinations of words that don't particularly sound great next to each other. And um, in looking at the great speeches of the past, I was really humbled and mind blown to see the the reporting and kind of the the summary of what was being said by um by just reporting on um on the word usage and one easter egg that i did want to leave everybody is a very common interview question is the word counter interview question i've talked about this at five ten times at this point if you interview for any technical position where you are being expected to code or work with coders, it is completely fair game to ask you to implement this word counter, which is basically, hey, here's a body of text. Give me a dictionary, you know, a JavaScript object of how many times each word appears in that. It's a very common 
bag of words representation of any unstructured text. I can set, I can put any amount of text in and I still want to get the frequencies of that text out. So my Easter egg is an implementation of that word count problem. And we'll see how I actually visualize the frequency of words um, in this visual. So I, uh, I do want to clean the text. Um, one thing I'll get at with, with how I'm running through this code top to bottom, it is D3, so it, it, it gets lengthy. I'm not intending to go line by line. I'm intending to go high level of my, my thought process of the problems I was trying to solve and then show the resulting visual. And we can use that to go backward and see how I implemented a specific detail and how I followed other people's work to deploy it online in a fashion where I can send out a link instead of, um, instead of saying, hey, let me come over with my laptop so I can show you the thing I did. Because when you're running locally, that's essentially the level that you're at. So I took the first 301 characters. That was just a, you know, a nice, um, essentially the first paragraph. So it gets into the topic of consideration for any visualization. What is our level of granularity in words? Is it the entire paper? Is it the entire speech? Is it one paragraph? Is it one sentence? Is it one word? It's probably not one word because there's not a whole ton of value in a single word. Um, a sentence is a good place to start, but then we can't contrast the, the, the word variation and the tempo because there's probably only one punctuation, maybe a comma in the middle. The paragraph and the entire paper view make a lot of sense because I want each paragraph to be excellently constructed as its own standalone point of delivery that has its own tempo and relates with the rest of the paper in a, in a cohesive fashion. So I wanted visualization on a paragraph level and I wanted visualization on an entire body of text level. So here I start with, um, I start with just the first, you know, 301 characters. That's if there's not text in, this is JavaScript for if not, you know, obviously Python's easier to write this stuff. And uh, we'll see actually how I made this interactive with, with giving users a text area for them to begin drafting their own text document or copy and paste their own uh, document into here. And then do some basic text cleaning, you know, just trim the end, replace the new lines. And um, these are some basic, uh, basic meta characteristics that I wanted to know. I wanted to know how many words I used. I wanted to know how many characters I used. I wanted to know how many unique words I used because I wanted to know how redundant I was. So if I use a hundred words, but only 10 of them are unique, I'm just repeating myself a ton. I want most of my words to be unique. And we see that with the idea of a, a term frequency inverse document frequency, the machine learning implementations on this always, negative always dampen commonly used words and or the because they don't offer any individually unique value they don't tell you anything that you couldn't get by removing them and focusing on the more rare words so here are the high level things that i wanted to uh, report on as well as punctuations you know i see these here um, X and Y axis. I wanted characters on my X axis. I want to know literally the length to make sure that, um, make sure that my big and word, big and small word usage was, uh, oscillated, um, adequately. You'll see the great speakers of, um, the great speakers that have been recorded do this extremely well. It was really humbling to really dive deep into Martin Luther King's speech 
you know, obviously one of the best ever to really watch, uh, watch him front load the little words and then use his uh, big words powerfully on top of exclamation points. We'll see that. Um, and then on the Y scale, I just wanted the words linear one, 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 one. Um, and we can, uh, we can start to see this time series move over time and uh, see any deviations from our normal tempo. I wanted to report on exclamation points. So set up your data structure. And again, remember our array of homogeneous elements is our favorite structure for visualization. I populate that right here. This is our array and I push exactly the singular data that I want to see per shape that I'm going to render, you know, whatever I want to render on the front end, I'm going to want to construct it in this fashion. We'll see actually, um, I went with rectangles because we love horizontal and vertical lines. Rectangles are really nice for us to picture and compare to other rectangles. And the punctuation, I actually just went with the, the symbol in and of himself as just text on the, on the page. And that's the difference in shape. We can tell what a question mark is and what a comma and what a period is just by looking at them in and of himself. So anything that was there before, because I want it to be dynamic, I'm gonna rip off anything that was there before just so this can continue to rerun. Remember this runs every single time I change my input. And the start of any good D3 is just give ourself a SVG to play with that has some predefined width and height. Smash on my X and Y axis, smash on a key. You'll, uh, you'll see me use some shapes here. And here's the bread and butter of what D3 is gonna give us is this lovely for each type thing that we get is I want to use this words viz array that I constructed and I want to render a rectangle for each word in my entire body of text over a time series from the first word I say to the very last. I wish I had the transcripts from this course that would have helped me improve my style, but we only have the written word that we've seen so far. So as a last minute addition, my own copy and paste, we'll see how this, uh, this comes up there. But the, the thing that D3 gives us is this for each type syntax where I can actually get into each attribute of, um, of each element that I wanna render. So each word, when I visualize has a width and a height. We'll see what that actually looks like. And then I wanna visualize my punctuations overlaid on that same visual. And here as promised is our lovely word count visual. I wanna sort, this is a, you know, JavaScript high to low, it sorts in, it sorts a dictionary. So, Remember I said we want that bag of words representation, how I have the frequencies associated with each word. I actually want to sort those high to low. So I want to say, hey, give me the words with the highest frequency up top and the ones with the lowest frequency in the bottom or sort however I, I think about that. And I basically just constructed a list for each of those. So enough with the code and uh, this, you know, exports this component and then index.js, which is um, basically our main entry point in every library that we're gonna think about, how the internet is gonna think about parsing your data, takes that component and it renders it in what started as a blank element and this is just javascript again document that get element by id that's javascript 101 we are not getting away from javascript and then i use this lovely tutorial right here to throw it onto github pages 
So create React app gives us that folder structure. This is 101, finding other people's work that have done the hard parts of the stuff that I'm not super familiar with myself. You know, I'm not a front end guy by any means, but thankfully there are intelligent people that have put together lovely tutorials of exactly the thing that I want to do. That sounds exactly like the thing I want to do. I want to take a React app and I want to throw it in GitHub pages in order that everybody can have a static web app and uh, not worry about any of the hard parts of hardware. And thankfully for us, there's even this GH pages NPM package. NPM is to JavaScript like pip is to Python. It is node package manager. It just lets us do JavaScript stuff from the command line, especially installing new packages. Gives us this package JSON file and by changing our username there, show you this package uh, JSON file. It actually gives me this as an up and running website. Great way to demonstrate to any potential employer. Full stack abilities, my ability to play around in every, every level. And um, luckily for us, we have things that make it just this easy. NPM run deploy, throws it onto GitHub pages and gives us a lovely up and running visual like in this one. So cut that out right now. Here's the first 301 characters. I wanted to know exactly how many characters I used. I mapped that on the X axis. I wanted to know exactly how many words I used. I mapped that on the Y axis. And I wanna know how many unique words I used and when my last unique word was used. Because very often when I'm just re reiterating what I already said, my last new word will be around the halfway point. So I wanted to make sure this last unique word was pretty near the end of what I had to say. And that is what I wanted to know from a high level perspective. I wanted some basic interaction. What do I mean by interaction? I wanna be able to hover over things and click on things, you know, in these first 300. I'm sorry, th those, um, those characters are the position where, where this is a, there's 249 full words. So a period and a comma happened at like 115 a period. The first period was 115. Yeah, I mean, characters is in the length of the word. I map that into the rectangle oh, length. Okay, longer right. words get a longer rectangle. I got it, I got it. That way, and what I think is artful, what it was wow. really That's humbling cool. for me to see is Martin Luther King used tempo. He uses all these really short words up front with no punctuation, really warms the crowd up, gets them engaged, makes it foundational for everybody at every level of understanding to be there and be present without throwing punctuation until later on and then starts dropping big words, greatest demonstration back to back after he uses all these little words um, to get people, um, to get people comfortable with being there to, you know, engage the crowd, just really, 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 obviously one of the best ever. This is the first, um, first paragraph, you know, I just default to, I default to this portion of the speech when, um, when nobody, uh, has typed anything, but, uh, also, I thought even better, um, like I said, there's two level of analysis that I wanted this to work for. I wanted it to work for the paragraph level of granularity, and I wanted it to work for the entire paper level of granularity. At the paper level, of, at the paragraph level of granularity, I can get things like individual word usage. You know, I can click, um, I could see, you know, each of these words, I promised you the word counter. Um, so I mapped word frequency to the, the size of the word. And we can see all the ones that I only use one time here. Uh, normal hover, normal, you know, click. Is that a bug or a feature that it hops up up there? I don't know, but I didn't care enough to change it. Normal hover work. I could see where each of my words are. 
um, and normal hover and interactions work how you would want them to. I wanted this to work for the, the paragraph level, which shows me how my words are interacting with themselves. You know, the commonly used words are sufficiently far spaced from each other. I think this is artful by obviously one of the best ever, you know, all the thes are far away. It's not just saying the same thing over and over. Uh, you know, today is there, you know, history is sufficient space. And when I go to the entire pay, ooh, sorry, the entire pay-per-view, let me grab that from my data. I left this as interactive as I could possibly make it in that you guys are uh, hopefully more than welcome to, to use this. This has actually really helped me in constructing emails, term papers. It saved me a lot of, uh, a lot of typos. Here's the entire paper, the entire speech, I mean. What was unbelievable to me, you know, we get rid of individual words, essentially. Uh, I, I made sure to map this at the bottom so we can get each of the occurrences of an individual word. Obviously, the common ones are up front. The off to and um, what I found to be unbelievable and really informative on the right way to construct something like this is you get the emphasis right out here. This is when he starts to get really excited. You know, we're not emphasizing anything until the part that you're supposed to remember. We have half of the exclamation points used in the tail end of the speech. Further, what really blew my mind, we have the common ones right here, you know, we see what the guy's talking about. We see we, we want to unite people. We want to throw people together. We want to give them instruction on what will happen. And we want freedom. We know what this guy's talking about. And we see with freedom, it bubbles right around the exclamation points. All of the uses of freedom, which was used 20 times, was all around the times when exclamation points start to be used also. So we really know what this guy is talking about. We really know what topics are being emphasized. And without hearing or reading the entire speech, we get a good overview. I say good tentatively because obviously I can't be as artistic and representative as the original, but I can visualize in two dimensions exactly what was said and exactly what was written as the speech. And in true, one of the best ever fashions, he has his last unique word out toward the tail end. He's not repeating anything that's said. He remains unique the entire time. So out of 1,600 unique, um, out of 1,600 words, 500 are unique. So on average, you know, only using a word three times. And we can run through, you know, normal clicks work, hover works, and um, we get where things are being bunched up as well. He does this arguably more better than anybody is spacing these commas to deliver statements in predictable homogenous tempo and that allows a, a sing-songy type um, musical delivery where when I have these groups of commas, I get a natural beat pattern for myself like this, it's this portion. And just mind blowing to watch, you know, one of the best ever is this paper JPEG background chart junk. We talked about chart junk, additional pixels without information. Is it chart junk? Probably, but it's my visualization. I can do what I want. And uh, 
I thought it was cute in the background. We we're talking about filling up pages with words. So thought it was a, a fair background for what we are talking about and at least maintain the horizontal and vertical scales that we want to talk about. So didn't think it was too, too chart junky. And this thing is available here. You're more than welcome. You know, this thing, I thing is interactive. If I, it catches things like, um, you know, me, me putting space, this has saved me in emails a few times. Do I really want this space there? Um, and hopefully this and this uh, demonstration can be my parting gift to, uh, to each and every one of you. In true fashion, what I would do if I had infinite time to go down the rabbit hole with this stuff, I would treat this um, constellation pattern in the same way that Shazam. Shazam, for anybody that doesn't know, is, is an app that their goal, their mission statement was we want to take up to two seconds of any music you hear and be able to identify the song. It's a quick look up with any blurb of any song. They use a constellation lookup. And my goal, what I would do if I had infinite time with this would be to map my tempo, my delivery of a speech that is to be delivered with the greats and say, hey, make my tempo sound more like MLK or JFK or any of the great speakers that we've been blessed to be, uh, to be able to listen to and make my style more like theirs or make my word choice more like theirs. Or, or fingerprint, um, you know, someone speaking or an author and say, hey, I think this is, this is so-and-so who wrote this or have spoken this um, based on uh, the analysis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, it was my attempt at a first iteration, a first layer in pre-processing for any fingerprinting type algorithm in deriving similarity between styles. Some of the style transfer in art, in paintings especially, has, uh, has been mind blown. And I wanted to bring those concepts over to the text processing mm -hmm. space. And this is my parting, to, uh, parting gift to everybody out there. I hope um, this has helped me construct emails and term papers. I, uh, it's saved me from submitting a lot of you know, goofy misworded things and it's available right here. The code base is available as well. You guys are more than welcome to, to clone and, you know, destroy it on, on your end, you know, give your own spin. I'm happy to see anything that comes out of that. Hopefully you can make this better than I, uh, than I did. And, um, thank you all so much for being here. Is there any, over and above that y'all would like to see in the next five seven minutes this is an additional comment what you did that would be a nice so i don't know if any of you have used the um the uh i, I forgot there's a voice you, you can basically it'll read a reader and it'll play back i think that's fantastic for you know sometimes just someone else reading it is really helps uh helps uh you're right, but you know this would be probably a nice add to Microsoft Word to do you know, analysis. Maybe you're using a word too frequently. I think it's already some of that is there, but this would be kind of a slick add um, for reviewing, you know, writings. That's awesome. Really. <clears throat>
Thank you much. <laughs> yeah, I figure it's like, uh, why be, yeah, I'm not smart enough to be literate at the same level as the best of them. So I figure we'll put some software and some visualization in the meantime to give us some guardrails and high level uh, overview of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, this is uh, pretty, pretty neat. <laughs> Great, thank you. I wanted, um, I was going to ask you uh, maybe um, there's a way to do a similar thing, but with voice recognition. Definitely. So that's a, a great opportunity to talk about the entire pipeline of the different forms of language. So when, when I think language, we think a series of words regardless of what, what language it's in, it's still a series of words. And even the translators, one language to the other, hi, hola, there's sometimes a one-to-one -one linear map, but more often than not, it's, um, it, it's not intuitive, especially in things like English, read versus read. And especially when I say it, is it, is it now, is it past tense, is it a color? They all sound um, or are spelled there's some overlap there. Um, in text processing right now, the pipeline is always spoken word into text. So there is a machine learning layer, like the series and the Alexas of the world will take the percussion pattern of spoken word and turn it into a string. And there are tools to do that also. Amazon has a pretty, uh, pretty good one. And 100% of what it gives you is you input a text file or a piece of text. If it's an API, you can just make a post request with a piece of text, uh, like a, a recording. And then the return is a string of the literal string that the spoken word probably was. So... That accomplishes the dimensionality reduction also because it takes something very, very chaotic of vocal percussion patterns and it turns it into something more manageable, more ready to have math done to it like a string. So definitely when language is not in string format, almost always it will need to be converted into string format. And that opens a really interesting area of possibilities with songs, like tempo, where maybe I don't want to turn it into a string. Maybe I just want to go right with the vocal percussion patterns to, and, uh, and stay there. And there's some interesting work there. Um, it just requires a huge amount more computational power and data because the input is so much more chaotic than string data is. So when you say dimensionalize and string, you're talking about categorizing uh, complex, you're categorizing your bucket, putting things into buckets, or did I miss that understanding? Hmm. I mean, string, like if I record myself on an MP3 or I ask Siri for something, okay. it records the percussion patterns. I got, yep, yep. It's like an analog type. Yes. That analog needs to be turned into a literal string like any programming language string. Or digitizing, yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's not perfect. There's going to be some error. It's obviously uh, gets into fuzzy statistics. What, uh, mm -hmm. you know, removing noise, especially, you know, talking to Siri in a car with the windows open, there's going to be some feedback. Um, we are lucky, we are blessed to have those models pretty well available for us. Where we don't have to write that step from scratch, we can definitely use one of those mappers that is already available. There's some open source ones and there's definitely uh, Amazon, you know, big cloud versions of those available. Um, but really, the thing to consider is how I want my cleaned data to look. For me, a string was good enough. 
maybe if I was doing a song with being mindful of a beat pattern, I would think a little more closely toward tempo over time rather than over character count. And I could even do something like syllables here instead. But obviously syllables are proportionate to word length. So word length was good enough for right now. But syllables is also something to consider. And different artist style, how long can they make a word take? Somebody sings slower or faster, it will change the amount of time consumed by speaking that word. So definitely a world of work left in this area. The world needs better text processing and language understanding. Definitely, definitely, definitely a fair amount of work left. So anybody interested? The world is your oyster. You can make this stuff better or you can watch it turn into the Terminator. Just kidding. Probably won't happen, but if, uh, if you don't make this stuff better, somebody else will make it a different way than you would have. So you could either watch that happen or you can be on the forefront of it happening. So thank you all so much for your patience and diligence with tough topic and uh, anything I could do to be helpful in the meantime, please feel free to reach out. We are at that four o'clock mark, which means stop.